walking up tonight, I could hear them real loud cheering over in the ball field. I said, somebody's baby's running. Come on, somebody's got their attention. Somebody's running the ball and somebody's... I said, God, don't let me do any less in the house of the Lord tonight. I could hear them all the way from that ball field over there cheering. I said, God, how much greater should the saints let a cheer go forth that he has been real to me. He went all the way, died for me. I don't ever want to sit down and, and do any less. I want us to go to prayer, and then I want Sister Sissy to lead them, sing that song, I Claim the Blood. I want us to go to prayer tonight specifically for Brother Clarence. He asked what his church pray for him. He's hurting his chest. I believe God can touch him right now. I believe he can do it while they're getting that song ready. I want you to stretch your hands toward glory and ask God right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I'm believing you to step into that place right now where he's at. There is nothing greater than your touch, Lord. I believe in God by the power of your word, God. You sent your word, God. I believe in that word. Go up in that house tonight. Touch his chest, God. Let him know that you heard and he is healed in the name of Jesus. Whatever it is, God, I believe in complete healing. Touch him, God. Let him be a testimony of the healing virtue of God. We're believing in the name of Jesus. Help him sing this song tonight. Hallelujah. I have a soul. church. Source, devil. <laughs> Strength. 
when I am weak. Come on, reach that for it. takes me through. He takes me through when, when life I is pressing me. Oh, love on him tonight. Tell him. y'all the other day about uh, you know I went down memory lane thinking about the first time I ever got filled with the Holy Ghost and I got kind of happy about that <laughs> and uh, I don't know why but this is all just keeps on my mind and so I found this song which y'all probably know it it says uh, no more shackles on my feet the devil has no hold on me Jesus blood has set me free the devil has no hold on me I tell you what, if you'll get that song on and go down the road, you'll lose control of the steering wheel. I tell you, it just makes me, re it reminds me of what I was and what I am now. It reminds me of, the, of how bound I was, of how bad it was for me to just walk around, couldn't figure out, you know, exactly what the deal was. Why am I not happy? I got this, I've done that. Nothing helped me. But when I found Jesus, or when he found me, whichever way you want to put it, when he saved my soul and set me free, I tell you what, there is no other feeling. I don't know why I keep saying that. There is no, I know you all know it, there's no other feeling like that. There's no other drug. There's no other bottle. There's no medicine. There's nothing that can make you feel like that. I guarantee you, if you tried it, you'd know what I'm talking about. Let's go ahead and get in this. Uh, we're going to take up tithes and offering, and then we're going to get on into this revival. I'm, uh, with Wendy, I'm so glad y'all come out to be with us tonight. It's so good to be in church on a Thursday night. Amen. It's good to have that good feeling outside we've been having. It's a little hot today, but it's been, you know, really nice. But it's nice to be in church on yeah. Thursday night. Amen. Um, Brother Evans, would you pray over this offering?
Brother Pat says, Sissy, help me sing his song. I want you to help me sing it. Every one of you know it. Brother uh, Myers, we're just going to turn him loose. Let him have plenty of time tonight. But I want you to help me sing this song. I love it. My, I, told, I tell you all the time, I see my mama singing it when I'm singing it. But I love it. Help me sing it tonight. Brother Myers is going to just tear loose. Ain't you glad that him and Sister Myers came back? They part. We done claimed them. They done part of us. <laughs> we love them. And I, he's just going to obey God. But I want us to just turn loose and sing this song. Come on. Houses and land I may not own. Earthly treasures call my own. Little person in this world I may be. I can't keep up with the styles, but I know I'm God's own child. I claim Jesus first, and that's enough for me. How many know it tonight? Sing it with me. I claim Jesus first of all. He will answer when I call, for I know I have a soul He set free. I am God's own child by birth Highest honor on this earth I claim Jesus first And that's enough for me Some folks live in wealth and pride I'm poor but satisfied Great Jehovah owns this world Now don't you see Underneath his loving wing I'm as happy as a queen I claim Jesus first And that's enough for me I believe some of you mean it tonight Help me I claim Jesus first Come on, stand to your feet and sing it with me Sing it For I know I have a soul That he set free I am God's own child by birth Highest honor on this earth I claim Jesus first And that's enough for me Some folks live in wealth and pride I'm poor but satisfied Great Jehovah owns this world Now don't you see Underneath his loving way, I'm just as happy as a queen. I claim Jesus first, and that's enough for me. Come on, sing it again. I claim Jesus first of all. He will end. He'll end. Hallelujah. For I know I have a soul that he set free. for me no matter how many votes I give Donald Trump anybody out there if I called they wouldn't answer come on now if I called their phone they wouldn't answer but the king of glory when I get up distressed in the midnight hour nanny the king of glory answers and says I'm right here I know right where you are sing that one more time for brother uh, Myers turns loose and obeys God I claim Jesus first of all he will answer when I call for I know I have a soul that he set free I am God's own child by birth highest honor on this earth I claim Jesus first somebody feel that Woo! hallelujah <laughs> houses and land I may not own earthly pleasures call my own little person in this world I may be I can't keep up Tonight I know I'm God's own child I claim Jesus first And that's enough for me That thrills my soul tonight I claim
song tonight. How many of you claim him as your own? Praise the Lord. What a wonderful thing to be able to be in revival tonight. Isn't that wonderful? I tell you what, as you look around, you think about all the different things that our country has gone through in the last few weeks and months, a virus ravaging through and just the impacts it's had on the world around us and such as that, uh, to see that there would be a crowd of people to show up for revival. I don't know if you realize it, but that speaks volumes. I know some of you have been through a great deal. Some may have even faced some sickness and such as that. But to know that you made the decision to be here tonight, what a, what a bold statement. That's, that's, that's a lot like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saying, I know, the, I know the risk. I know what it could be. I know, I know all about it. But I'm taking this risk tonight because I really need to be fed in my soul. And it's, a, it's always a great privilege to be back here to be able to preach the Word of God. I mean, just a tremendous honor uh, to be able to preach here at the Refuge. We love all of you. We have been treated uh, just wonderfully by the people here, and that has always been just a soft spot in our heart, I guess you could say. But one of the things that has always been a great blessing to me in a lot of ways to be able to preach here and to associate myself with the good people here is the simple fact that a lot of the people here remind me of the church that we pastor uh, in the fact that uh, our people, they're just down-to-earth people. They're not trying to impress a bunch of people and be some big thing. Uh, they're down-to-earth, and they're one word that is just, as, as the longer I serve the Lord, this one word or this one thing has really impacted me in people's walk more than anything else, and that's sincerity. And uh, I know you, you folks are sincere. I can hear it in your testimony. You know, you can get around people, and you can tell when they're sincere and when they're not. And that just means a lot to me. But on the way up here, uh, you know, I just I always cherish the wonderful time I have with my beautiful wife. We have been together for a really long time. A lot of folks have heard her say it many times since she was 13 and I was 15. So we've been together. She's been putting up with me for a long time. I, I told a group of young people a while back, I said, the key to it all, I said, these young men, I said, you find you a wife that will put up with you until you become a man. That's what you got to do. But, uh, but I've got a wonderful wife, and on the way up here, we enjoyed some time together. Uh, there was a few moments where I just kind of went off in my own mind, my meditation of my mind, thinking about things. And I thought about revival in general and the, and the reason and the prospects of, of why that we have revival. Uh, some of you that may follow us or see us online, you may notice that not too long ago we had a revival with Brother Harold Hanks and uh, told Sister Wendy, I think, I said, you know, right before the revival was to start, uh, us, like a lot of other churches, have faced this very thing. Uh, but it was a Thursday night. That's our typical midweek service. And uh, on that Thursday night, we didn't have but maybe five to seven people show up. And that was a Thursday right before revival was to start. And as a pastor, now if you're a pastor, you understand this better, but you kind of panic a little bit yourself and you think, Lord, is this a prelude to what revival is going to be like? And I have a lot of respect for Brother Hanks. I look to him in a lot of ways almost like a, a pastor of sorts. He, he has helped give me great advice in times of need. And so I knew he was coming, but uh, I told Brother Hanks, I said, Brother Hanks, I, I, I'm just telling you in advance, I don't know how many people will show up. And he messaged me back, and he said something along the lines. He said, well, now, Brother Joe, he said, now, if this ain't a good time, now you just let me know. And I thought about it for a minute, and I'm just one of them people. I don't like to beat around the bush or just say something that ain't true. They call that lying, if you didn't know. And, and uh, I messaged him back, and I said, well, I'm just going to be honest with you. I said, um, I'm just taking a step of faith. 
And I don't know of any better time that we need revival than right now. I said, uh, you know, it could be four, maybe five. I don't know what it's going to be, but we're going to take a step of faith. And if for no other reason, I'm going to tell you this, is God's honest truth. If for no other reason, if nobody in the church got revived, that would break my heart. But if for no other reason, my wife and I, believe this or not, during all this shaking that has been going on in the religious community, if we could call it that, within the church, uh, even some of the, the people who are at the top end as far as ministry and that, many of them have begun to get a little weak, discouraged, and uh, you can only imagine when you're pastoring churches and you have the responsibility and you're looking out for people's souls and you look around and one day you got a crowd and the next thing you look around, there's not many people. And so it's very disheartening and very discouraging. And we went through that. I'll be honest with you. Right before we had revival, I thought to myself, Lord, I feel sometimes like I'm hanging by a thread. And that's a terrible thing to have to say from a pastor. I mean, honestly, but I've, I've, I've always made it up in my mind. I'm not going to go to the pulpit and uh, make God's people think it's something that it ain't and set the bar in a position that it's not. And so uh, the revival really, really strengthened me. And so tonight, uh, as I came here today, the one thing that my main goal is, if I cannot be a blessing to the people at the uh, church here in Live Oak or the, maybe the people that watch online, then I just assume not go. But if we can somehow be an inspiration or a help, then, Lord, just let your perfect will be done. And so that's why we're here tonight. I say this. I've said it in the past, and I'm going to tell you again tonight. If you wonder why are we here, is it because Sister Wendy and I are good friends and uh, we love each other, we pray for one another and that kind of thing? The reason I am here tonight, my wife is here. The reason my wife took off work this week and I took off work to be here was for you. We came here for you. That's why we came here. I didn't come here to make a name. I got all the preaching I could do at Gray Street Church. And so I am here for you, and I want you to be comforted in knowing that the Lord is going to work in that, and He's going to help us over the next few days. So if you got your Bibles tonight, we're going to try to get right into the Word of God, and we're going to trust the Lord to just speak to us. Uh, we're going to turn in our Bibles tonight to the book of Ecclesiastes. That's a book that, uh, you know, you don't hear a lot of preaching out of, but we're going to turn there tonight. Ecclesiastes chapter number 11, verse number 1. For those of you that may have seen me uh, talking to the sister here about uh, of the video and giving her my cell phone here and trying to set everything up, uh, that was because Sister Wendy asked me to help out tonight, not because I'm trying to uh, do anything. I'm just trying to help her out. She asked me, could I help? Because we got a little bit of an issue, I guess, with the Internet stream. And so we're streaming from my phone tonight. Hopefully by tomorrow night I'll have it figured out so that we can stream from the church's uh, uh, Facebook page. But we're here tonight. Let's have church. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1, and if you have it, say amen. amen. The Bible said here, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven and also to eight. For thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there shall it be. Now I want you to listen to verse number 4. We're going to preach this out, but I do want you to read along here. He that observeth the wind shall not sow. And he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. As thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb, or her that is with a child, even so thou knowest not the works of God, who maketh all. He tells us what to do in verse number 6. I want you to look at it with me. In the morning... Sow thy seed. And in the evening will hold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall prosper either this or that, 
or whether they both shall be alike good. With the Lord's help tonight, I'm going to preach on a thought that I feel, I feel as though the Lord has given me to start this revival on, and that is simply turning loose. Turning loose. Turning loose. Would you pray with me tonight? Lift your heart and hand. Let's begin to pray and ask the Lord to have His mighty way. Father, tonight we thank You for the goodness of Your Word. I'm asking you for the next few moments, Lord, that you'll use the Word of God to speak to those that are in need tonight. I pray that you'll touch my mind, my spirit, my body, bring back to remembrance the things, God, that you put in my heart to preach to this church. Truly, Lord, we're here in sincerity seeking for revival. For those that have become weak and spiritually anemic, I pray, God, that you will revive our soul. For those, God, that have fallen by the wayside, I pray, God, that you will pick them up, strengthen them by thy mighty hand. Lord, for those, God, that are in ministry tonight, that may be here or watching online, that need a word of encouragement, I pray, God, strengthen their mind and spirit as well. And we'll give you praise for every beautiful thing that is accomplished and everybody can say amen. Amen. As you're being seated, look around you and tell them let's have revival tonight. It's been many years, looking back tonight, since the Lord allowed me to be able to revisit this particular portion of the text that I've read to you tonight. The last time that God allowed me to preach in this book and in this text, the Lord had given me a message that was burned into my heart, and I preached it at the Grace Street Church of God, where that I'm a pastor. And I was unaware at the time that God was giving me a message that in time to come would become the most recognized message that I had ever preached before. Since that time, I've not felt the liberty of the Lord to go back to this particular text to preach anything. But the message that I preached previously is going to be a little bit different tonight than what I preached in the past. But in the past, uh, the Lord had given me a message with a title on Don't Die with a Handful of Grain. And in this particular message that God gave me, it was, it was basically drawing on the principle of us dying, coming to the end of life, and never using what God has blessed and empowered us as a people to use for His glory. But it was a few days ago that God began to deal with my heart. I woke up one morning and I didn't understand the reason why, but the Lord just spoke two words to me. And that was turning loose. I tell you, I've said maybe this in the past, but one of the hardest things to do is when the Lord gives you a message and you have another meeting to preach, and yet you've got more services at your home church to preach, because it sure would be easy to preach that at your home church. But I'm just one of those that if God gives me a message, I don't want to just a toss it around like a TV dinner. I believe that if it is given for a particular time, that God gives it for that time and that time alone unless He tells you something else. But the Lord began to speak the words turn or turning loose into my spirit. And when the, when the Lord gave me this over the last few days, I, I've kind of wrestled around with this idea. And as it seemed like every time that I would lay down, whether at night or to take a nap or getting up in the morning and I was kind of half in and half out, I would find my mind racing thinking about all these things that the Holy Ghost was beginning to give me on the thought or the idea of turning loose, turning, letting go of something, turning loose of it. And at that time, I, I didn't know where God was going to connect the dots, if you will, on the text that He would give me. Sometimes as a preacher, God will give you a text and you know right along that He'll give you uh, the thoughts as the time goes by. And then there's other times that He may give you a thought and later on connect that with a particular text. And that's what happened this go around. So the Lord began to speak to my heart and began to lead me back to the text that we're looking at here tonight and preaching on the subject of turning loose. 
You see, for us, for me and you to turn loose, it is to loosen up our hold on whatever we're clinging to or whatever might be in our possession. It's to loosen our grip and begin to let go of something that we've got a hold of. It's a principle that we find in the Bible in more than just one place. If you look in the New Testament, you'll remember there was a place there where that the Lord told the disciples, He said, I want you to go into a particular city. And he said, when you get there, you're going to find a colt that's going to be tied in a way where two, two ways meet. There's going to be a colt that's never had anybody sit on it. And uh, he said, I want you to loose that colt, and I want you to let him go. But he didn't stop there. He said, I'm, I want you to loose him because I have need of him. Isn't that a wonderful thought that there's things that God expects to be loose so that he is able to use it? You see, if something's tied up and it's not able to be used of God, then what good is it? But when it's loosed for the service and for the glory of God, can you say that's a beautiful thing? We see that principle in the Old Testament. There's a portion where the Bible talks about the living bird. If you, re if you reflect back to the old ceremonies where that they would declare a leper cleansed, and they would begin to take a ceremony where there were two birds. And I don't have time to go through the whole ceremony, but when they get toward the tail end of the ceremony, they would take the living bird and they would set him free, loose him into an open field. He is a representation of the freedom. And that man that that once was uh, he, he was uh, plagued by leprosy is now free to go in the open plain and uh, you'll remember if you studied that portion of the bible that there's a beautiful connection between that and Jesus Christ of the new testament what is that brother myers well when they dipped that living bird down in the bird that was killed's blood they dipped it down into a basin that was filled with blood and water how many of you remember in the new testament where that Jesus he his blood was shed but do you remember when the soldiers come along and they pierced his side the Bible said that forthwith came what blood and water and so there's a beautiful typology or connection there that we can see but nonetheless you understand that that living bird being set free loosed in the field is a beautiful representation of what God is able to do when something that is tied up is loosed by the power of God can you say thank the Lord you see, tonight, if you're claim, if claiming to be saved, how many tonight says I'm saved? Well, if you are claiming to be saved, then you already understand the principle behind the idea of turning loose. Why is that? Because you already realize that for you to get saved, you had to move. You had to do something. There was something on your behalf that had to be done. You couldn't just sit there and look at God and say, well, you know, I thank you for what you did and I want to be saved, but I don't want to move. I don't want to change I don't want to do nothing that's not the way it works come on and say amen you had to turn loose from the old life that you used to live and you had to reach out for that newness of life that comes from Jesus Christ can you say thank the Lord but what I want you to see tonight in this turning loose is that the hidden manna that is in our text tonight is to understand the benefit or the reward that comes not from just holding on to, but rather the turning loose of something. You see, there are things that we may hold on to that it is a good thing. How many of you know tonight it's a beautiful thing to hold on to the Lord? To hold on. Do you know the Bible said any man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Is that not what the Bible said? And so it's a good thing to hold on to the plow, what you say. It's a good thing to hold on to the to traditions that the Bible said we've been taught by forefathers. It's a good thing to hold on to the Word of God. It's a good thing to hold on to a lot of things that are spiritual and that are of God. Can you say amen to that? But you see, what God was trying to show us through this text is that there are times uh, that you may be inclined to hold on to something that God wants you to let go of. And the only way that there's going to be a harvest and the only way you're going to reap is if you're first willing to let go of some things.
Now I know what some may be thinking tonight. Some may say, well, Pastor Myers, I feel like that I've got nothing. To, I don't feel like I'm holding on to the world. And I feel like I let go of that back in 1972. And I feel like I, I don't feel like I'm holding on to anything. I'm here, ain't I, Pastor? I, I'm trying to do the Lord's work. But you'd be surprised at how many people that claim to be blood-bought, how many that claim to be baptized in the Holy Ghost, uh, that are still holding on to things things in their lives. Some are still holding on to their pride. Some are still holding on to bitterness. Some are still holding on to jealousy. Some have got hidden addictions and things that nobody else knows about but them and God. There are hurts and pains of the past. Self-guilt and things you've gone through. Dark valleys and storms of things that you may not talk about in public. You may post a pretty picture on Facebook or you may hold a smile when you're checking out at Walmart but deep down inside there are some things you've held on to and you come to church and you can't get a breakthrough and the reason is uh, is because you're still holding on to something that the Spirit meant for you to let go of a long time ago if you feel what I'm saying somebody shout glory you see the Bible here is alluding to a common problem that was in the land in that particular day anybody ready for a short Bible lesson tonight because some of you read this text like I did when I first got saved and it didn't mean I just did not understand it it didn't make a lot of sense but a little bit of study will reveal to you that during this time in the Bible they had a problem in that land it was not an uncommon thing for the for the fields to flood with flood waters it would be a it was not an uncommon thing for the waters to rise up in certain land in certain areas and so this was problematic for the farmers of that day because what is a farmer going to do when he's got him a, a sack we'll just say this is our sack tonight what is a farmer going to do when he's got a sack year uh, full of last year's uh, grain or seed uh, left over ready to sow into the fields of this year and he and he goes to, I just want you to think of it this way he goes to the front door of the house he's getting ready to walk outside and he's going to go do his uh, his yearly or annual thing and he's going to get the horses and the plows or the ox or the donkey or whatever and he's going to go into the field uh, and he's going to plow up and he's going to sow his seed in the ground but the problem is uh, that when he goes to the front door of his house and he goes to step outside uh, he looks and out there in the field uh, is a whole lot of water everywhere you look. How many's ever planted water in flood? How many's ever planted seed in flood waters? That, that just don't even make good sense now, does it? And so when the problem arises, uh, the problem is uh, the difficulty of being able. Now I'm going to preach with the Lord's help tonight. It, the problem is the difficulty of being able to sow seeds uh, whenever the conditions are not right. Somebody say the conditions lately hadn't been too good you see the problem is uh, is trying to sow seed uh, it, when, when the conditions are just not conducive uh, to seed sowing when the season is right when it feels like it's the right time to have revival but nobody's on board with it the conditions ain't right this one says I won't be there because of this and that one says I can't come because of that and this one says man our family got hit with coronavirus uh, and we're going go like, to go underground like a groundhog we ain't coming out till the vaccine's released pastor we still love the Lord but we won't be there because the conditions are not ideal somebody say God help the church tonight you see that's why the Bible said in verse number 1 and I don't want to get away from the text I want to, I want to preach this out will you let me do that tonight in verse number 1 the Bible said cast thy bread upon the waters for thou shalt find it after many days what was the Bible alluding to there what was, he, what was he pointing out? You see, the people of that day understood because they lived in it. They knew it. You see, for some farmers, what they learned was if they would sow their seeds on top of the water, when the waters would recede or when the water would gravitate to a place where a high ground might be, that what would begin to happen is the seed would begin to sprout in that ground wherever it receded to or the ground that it found. And so what you would find is there would be some some farmers who wouldn't sow at all but there was a handful that got tired of waiting uh, and they started throwing their seed on top of the water 
My, I feel like the Holy Ghost is going to help us. They would sow their seed right on top of the water. And when the water would find high ground or a seed, it would, it would start springing up. And so instead of walking out the house in the next season and looking around and finding perfectly made rows of potatoes or corn or whatever they, made, they planted back then, but instead of finding perfectly ideal rows, they'd walk around their property and over here would be a big patch of potatoes. Over there might be a big patch of corn now they didn't purposely plant it there but they didn't want to wait forever because if you do you're never going to reap you're never going to have a harvest can you say amen I'll tell you tonight if you wait on the perfect conditions the devil will have it so messed up for the rest of your life you will never somebody say I will never sow you see, in, again in verse number 2, they are encouraged to turn loose of their seeds and share them with the less fortunate. That's what the Bible's talking about here. It says, give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. In other words, share with your brother. Work with those around you. Why? Because you don't know who might not be as successful and their seed might not take root like yours does. So share it with your brothers and sisters. Let me tell you, if if there's ever been a time that a lot of the very elect of the church are hanging by a thread, it's tonight. There's a lot of pastors tonight that are not knowing what tomorrow holds for the church. Some of them are financially hanging by a thread. Some of them don't know who's coming back, whether the church doors are going to fold. They just don't know. And what sometimes we find ourselves doing, we go into survival mode. It's me, myself, and I. You see, I can't share the gospel I can't be active in the ministry I can't actively witness for the Lord because if you only know what I've been through you wouldn't sow seed either you wouldn't talk to the woman at the checkout line down at the Kroger's if you knew what I've been through let me tell you what that's such is foolishness that's exactly what the devil wants Uh, he wants you to put your seed back in your pocket Uh, he wants you to take the seed back to the house and put it on a shelf he wants you to regard the wind uh, and the waves uh, and the sky and not sow the seed God gave you. Somebody say turn loose tonight. Then in verse number 3, he reminds them that it's not going to rain. There is nothing you can do to stop it. Let's read what he said. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. In other words, you can't change that. I can't change COVID-19. I can't make people come to church. I can't just snap my fingers and give the church a Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir every time they come to church. Come on now and say amen. I can't change what's in them clouds. If they're full of rain, guess what? They're going to dump rain. That's right. He said, if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there shall it be. In other words, church, it's going to be what it's going to be. You got to learn what God wants the church to do while it's being what it's going to be. You got to find your place in God and learn what it means to turn loose. Somebody tonight that's willing, you just look up to God and say, God, help me to learn how to turn loose. Lord, help us tonight. But the real problem that he points out is in verse number four. Look there with me for just a moment. That which they cannot stop stops them that thing I I, I just want to pause because I I want this to sink in the thing they cannot stop stops them I can't help it that I don't have four or five piano players at my church I can't help it that my drum players got to work on a lot of nights and can't be there and so we got to ad lib and make, make do with people that I love to death, but some of them couldn't play a tambourine if their life depended on it. Come on now and say amen. What, I, what I'm trying to tell you is the real problem is these people are letting the thing that, that is stopping them, they're letting this thing they cannot stop, stop them. They're letting the things they cannot control stop them. 
I want you to know that just because of COVID-19, just because of all the setbacks, or just because all the, the hard hits that the church has taken, it does not mean that God has put the church on pause. It does not mean that he put missions on pause. It doesn't mean that he don't want to revive the church. Hey man, let me tell you, just like Brother Hank said when he came to our church, there are some risks that some people better be ready to take. What do you mean, Pastor Myers? Well, I'll tell you like this. There are some people, they're so afraid of COVID-19, they're going to end up dying and backsliding and losing their own soul while they stay at the house and stay safe. And some of them's going to get it eventually anyway. I want you to know, you've got to use good judgment. Say amen. You've got to use wisdom. If you don't, you might be the next one lost. But I don't ever want to get to the place that I let the thing I cannot stop stop me from doing God's will. Oh, somebody say, help us, Lord. I want you to see. He says in verse number four, listen. He that observeth the wind shall not... He that observeth the wind shall not sow. He that regardeth the clouds he shall not reap. As thou knowest not what the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. Well, Brother Myers, what, 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 what exactly is, is he telling them? Uh, I may get just a little bit ahead of myself here, but can we, can we make it real for just a moment? Imagine, anybody got any farmers in your, in your family or some that were farmers, maybe daddies or uncles or somebody? I don't know. I know they probably didn't wear overalls, but I mean, I've got a fanciful imagination, so you'll have to pardon this preacher. But in my mind, Sister Wendy, I, I started reading this text, and I could close my eyes, and I could see an old farmer get up out of bed, Go to the front door of the house, open up the front door, go to walk out with his sack of seed or his sack of potential. But he pauses for a minute because he's a seasoned, he is a seasoned farmer. He knows the risk because when he looks up in the air, the clouds are forming over and the sky is beginning to be black. Because your mind says, now hold on a minute now. You might step on out there, Mr. Farmer. And you might get out there with your ox and your plow. And it might come pouring down rain and then you'll waste your seed out there. You get soaking wet. Probably what you ought to do, you probably ought to go back in the house and get you some eggs and grits and tell Mama to put some bacon on the, in the frying pan and we'll try it tomorrow, Mama. But the problem is, you come out there and you open up the door and today you look out in the sky, it's just all black, clouded over. So I, we, we're not going to turn loose today. We're not going to turn loose of our seed today. If I get anything on the floor, I promise I'll vacuum it up. Sometimes I come up with these crazy ideas and they seem better in my head than they are in real life. But he goes to the front door of that house the first day and I'm just imagining maybe it might have been like, well, you know what? The skies are all black and dark. It just don't make no sense to sow no seed today. So he said, well, we'll try it again tomorrow. So he gets up the next day and he goes to the front door. He goes open up and the door about slings clean up. It said, he that regards the clouds, he that regards the wind, that man that's regarding the weather. You may tell you what the problem is with a lot of the Pentecostal church today. I'm going to teach y'all something new. You can just, you can say this too. We have become spiritual weather forecasters. I hate to tell you this, but I've been in church with a lot of folks when they walk in the door. Whoa, Lord of mercy, brother so-and-so here. We're going to have church tonight. Whoa, that brother there, he can throw down preach. We're going to have church tonight. I've even watched folk, they'll sit on the singing because they are waiting for the preaching. Or vice versa. Some of them, I've even been in church before where they didn't like the preaching so they'll shout during the singing so they didn't have to hear the preaching. 
How you know? Because I talked to him after the service was over with. I ain't saying y'all are doing that. Please, my Lord, help us. But what I'm telling you is, is that people come in and they become spiritual weather forecasters. Well, we're looking at the schedule. It's prom- And I'm going to tell you, I've been guilty of this. Somebody say, help Brother Myers. I'm on the way to church and I'm driving down the road. I'm headed to the church and all of a sudden the clouds, the sky just falls out. And it looks like, man, uh, it looks like Noah's Ark's going to come floating by about any minute. And the first thing that comes to my mind, I wonder who's going to show up tonight. Are y'all helping me preach? Now, don't tell me y'all ain't never done that. If y'all do, come on now. Y'all got something I ain't got. But, but you, you ever come to church before and you sat there during the service? And it seemed like, man, it was just so dry. And then Sister So-and-so gets up there, and, uh, and the song don't go very good four or five times. And listen, I don't go to church here, so I don't know Sister So-and-so, and I don't know who's singing and who ain't. But, but I, I came here. I didn't know nothing. I didn't want to know nothing. But she gets up there, and she has a hard time getting a song together. And then there you are, twiddling your thumbs. Pick your phone up, playing with your phone, looking at it. And if y'all see me on my phone, it ain't because I'm playing. It's because I'm trying to get this stuff here straightened out. But you're playing with your phone, you're looking around, and the first thing that comes to your mind, now if you ain't never done this, just pray for the one that has. Then you go to thinking to yourself, why did I even come to church tonight? I sure didn't get up. I sure didn't iron my clothes. And I sure didn't do my hire. So I can go to church. And I can hear her fumble around. Don't know what she wants to do. Ain't been anointed since last Christmas. And here we're going to try to go through another dead dry service. I could have stayed home and watched Jimmy Swaggart. Come on, I know how church folk talk. I know how they think because I've heard it. But let me tell you this. What, what that is, you become a spiritual weather forecaster. Let me tell you what I love. I love it when God just blows your mind. Somebody say me too. Now don't say if you don't mean it. But I went to a church many years ago, and I'm telling you that God's on His truth. I went to this church. Every time I've been there, I was dead as cracker juice, and that's dry. And I mean to tell you, every time they'd ask me to preach, I was a young preacher, and I was just biting at the bit. I was hoping I'd get called to preach. But every time the phone rang and it was go to there, I thought, oh, Lord, have mercy. I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach my guts out, and they're going to keep theirs in. They say they want revival, but, boy, you couldn't tell it. I mean, you couldn't tell it. I think they'd enjoy it. I love Lucy more than they would of me preaching. But I went there one night, and I thought on the way there, I even told my wife, I said, well, you know about the way it's going to be tonight? You see, that was back in the day when as a young minister, I was used to going to church, and in a month, you might have had out of a month's worth of services, three to five services where the Holy Ghost blow out, and there wasn't no preaching. We used to say, the Holy Ghost took over. Well, the truth was, he said, always had take over. But y'all know what I mean. And so I didn't like to go through no dead dry service. And I went there that night and thinking to myself, oh, it's going to be terrible tonight. I may have told this story before, but if I did, forgive me. But I went in there that night. I thought for sure it was going to be dead and dry. But that night, I don't know, there was a sister in that church. We got to singing some old red back hymnal songs with the stanzas and all. Stopping at everyone. I mean, it, that just about kill it for everybody. And I mean, we were singing, doing everything. But there was a sister in that church. I don't know, maybe something in the song got a hold of her. And I mean, all of a sudden, she tap danced outside the aisle. And she got to running around, shouting. Uh, the next thing you know, there were people in that church that got to feeling what sister was feeling. And the next thing you know, I looked around. And I felt like the Holy Ghost said, don't ever count me out. Let me tell you somebody. Don't don't you ever walk to the front door and look at the rain and the clouds uh, and think there's no time to turn loose. Uh, there are some of you should have turned loose a long time ago. Uh, somebody say, God, help us tonight. But I'm glad tonight that he tells us what to do. In verse 6, he tells them the remedy to the problem. And refuge, I want to tell you, the remedy to the problem is right here. Somebody say, help us, God. In the morning, in the morning, Sow thy seed. You know what you got to do to be able to sow seed? You got to let go of it. You got to turn it loose. There's a lot of folk that come to church and they leave. They come to church with it and they leave it with it. They go to work with it and they come home with it. They go to the altar with it and get up with it. But I want to say anybody said, I'm tired of being like that. 
How many of you remember a day when people used to turn loose in the church? I'm not, I'm not trying to be critical. Man, there's been a few times I've been right there. I told my wife, I began to tell her a little bit about what God told me and began to show me. And I said, do you know that when you turn loose, that a lot of times the Lord will bring you to the threshold of the door and show you the opportunity of what you could do? Let's make it real. Those are those times where the Holy Ghost shows you, get up and go over there and lay hands on sister so-and-so. And the Spirit of God's dealing with you. And can I just make it real? It's like you in the back of your mind saying, but that's not social distancing now. And I don't think her, I don't think her cousin likes me. She ain't liked a Facebook post in a year, and I know she don't like me. She don't look at me when she comes in church. I know she don't like me. You're just regarding the clouds and the rain and the winds. But I hear the Spirit saying, cast thy Bread upon the waters. You never know what's going to happen. He said, when you get up in the morning, don't you go to the front door. Look around and say, well, another day, another church service. Don't you dare go to church in another revival and look at it. Well, guess we ain't going to have a blowout tonight. Guess ain't nobody going to get baptized in the Holy Ghost tonight. Well, we ain't got a full piece band tonight. Guess the music ain't going to be good tonight. Amen. The PA's messed up. Guess ain't going to be no preaching tonight. Let me tell you, when you stop giving excuse, you'll begin to see the power of God move the way it did in Brush Harbor days. Somebody say amen. I begin to feel like preaching tonight. I want to tell you tonight, if we could just give us a vivid picture of what the writer is telling us, you would understand that it doesn't matter if it's a windy day. It doesn't matter if it's somebody that don't like you. It doesn't matter if the pastor said, I need you to teach this adult Sunday school class. And the devil says, you ain't got but a fifth grade education. It doesn't matter if the Lord deals with your heart and says, I want you to be the next youth pastor. And you say, but I'm 67 years old. It doesn't make no difference. God said, quit holding on to your gift. Somebody say, turn loose. It's about high time. We quit calling ourselves Pentecostals and all we know how to do is hold on to it. Man, it's time for us to turn loose. It's those spontaneous moves of God that have hallmarked the church and made the Pentecostal movement a movement worth being a part of. Say amen. Can I testify to you for just a moment? I I thought back several, several years ago and I remembered... I got invited to preach at the home church where I had got saved. It was the old Koi Church of God, not far from where we pastor today. And the pastor there, he called me up. He said it was either him or somebody in his church, and I don't remember if it was homecoming or pastor appreciation. But for me, that was a great honor to go back to your home church and preach such a special event, special occasion. But the bad thing was, back then, Sister Myers can tell you, I hardly ever got sick. And I don't know, but something come over me and I got so sick I couldn't hardly stand up. But I made it up my mind. This is an opportunity the devil ain't going to take away from me. And I'll never forget that night. Sister Kim, this is how I preach that day. I preach like this, hanging on the side of the pulpit. And I'm I'm, I'm telling you the God's honest truth tonight. A preacher knows when they feel the anointing come on them. There are services, there are times you're going to preach and you'll feel a heavy anointing. Sometimes you feel somewhat anointed. The, and not the anointing's the anointing. And I know somebody may leave and yeah, they may not understand what I'm saying. But I think Sister Wendy could vouch for what I'm saying. There are times you just feel just such a saturating anointing. I preached barely hanging on the side of that pulpit that day. And I mean, when I got done preaching, I didn't pull my shirt collar out. It was pulled out of here. My pants was wet down to my knees. I was wet down into my socks because we had, we had such a move of God. We shouted until we just about passed out that night. I'm telling you, we had one move of God that was phenomenal. He ever had waves of the Holy Ghost falling. That's what we call it, where the Holy Ghost would fall. And the next thing you know, it just waves. People shouting and running and speaking in tongues, rolling in the Thor, the power of the Holy Ghost. I watched that happen that, that day. I think it was either two or three thing times up to that point. And we were coming down where things were winding down. Believe it or not, Pentecostal people get tired. The older I get, the more I realize. And some of you older than me, I'm, I'm already, boy, I sympathize with you. But the service was coming down 
winding down. We had already had the Holy Ghost fall in that service powerfully several times. All of a sudden, this fella that just got saved the night before, sent about three quarters of the way back, nobody there, none of us knew who he was. We don't recognize him. He's a new face. He stands up. He, out, he seemed to me like he didn't even know what testimony was, but he felt like he needed to do one. He said, I just want to tell everybody here. He said, last night, he said, I was at my house. And he said, boy, I'm telling you, I was drunk out of my mind. Boy, all of a sudden, some of these people, they're like really tuned in now. Huh? They're listening. He said, I was drunk out of my mind last night. He said, I could care less about church, about God, or about anything. He said, but while I was sitting there, you know what happened? Somebody decided to turn loose. Heard a knock at the door. And he called the sister's name that came over to talk to him about the Lord. Sister so-and-so knocked on the door and said, I felt like the Lord wanted me to come talk to you. He said, well, I kind of felt obligated. I let her come in. And he said, she sat down and got to telling me about the Lord. And he said, after a while, he said, he said, I got saved. And he said, I noticed that I went from being drunk to suddenly being sober. And he went to open up his mouth to say one more thing. And all of a sudden, a fellow that didn't know nothing about nothing got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Man, I'm telling you, that place come unglued at the seams. That old fella got to looking like, what in the world is going on with me? He was a shouting and a jerking and speaking in tongues, speaking in a heavenly language as the Holy Ghost baptized him. Just imagine if that man wouldn't have been willing to turn loose and stand up and testify. Just imagine if that woman wouldn't have been willing to turn loose and go to that man's house and knock on the door and tell him about the love of Christ. Oh, my God in heaven, where are the sisters and where are the people today that are willing to let go and let God have his way? Somebody say, God help the church of tonight. You see, this text has left me wondering a lot of things. What have we held on to that has left us void of a harvest, void of a breakthrough, void of revival? I mean, can I just I just be crazy, candid? There you sit on the, there you sit on your pew or your chair, and you feel a little bit of the moving of the Holy Ghost, and ain't nobody else really getting in, and you think, well, I don't want to be the crazy person here. I don't want to be odd. I don't. I hate to break it to you, but us Pentecostal people, we can be crazy, and I don't mean in a bad way. We're just crazy about the Lord. So just go ahead and get your crazy on. How many times have you felt like, you know, I've even, I, I, maybe I may have said it. I don't know. I may have been guilty of this. But I've had times where I, I pastor somebody, and every time you turn around, whoo, I felt like I could have shouted tonight. Well, I'll be glad when you turn loose and just go ahead and do it. Whoa, I feel like I could run tonight. We're going to get with it. Well, I got a bad leg, and you just are guarding the clouds and the wind and the rain. Get up and sow your seed. Because every time you come to church and you hold on to it and you don't loose, you don't turn loose of what God put in you. You are doing that church. You're doing the people around you and you're doing your family and yourself an injustice. Let me tell you, God didn't give us the blessing, but He gave you the power of the Holy Ghost. Not to speak in tongues. That's just a byproduct of the Holy Ghost. He gave you the power to be a witness and a light and an inspiration to the world. Say amen. It would do the church good for us to get back to the day that we could quit holding on. But it's left me wondering, is it because of the opinions of other people? Well, I'm worried about what people think. 
We had a fellow by the name of Gary in the church when I got saved. He had said he felt called to preach, but he wasn't baptized in the Holy Ghost yet. And uh, one day we were sitting around talking. He was about close to my age, got saved about around the time I got saved. And he said, well, to be honest with you, brother, he said, man, I've seen some, I've seen some Pentecostal people. They, they buck and jerk and they flip and flop. And he said, I don't want to get, I don't want to act crazy. I laughed. Because he said, I will never do that. I laughed. I said, "Mm mm-hmm. I said, it might be the one thing you turn loose. It might be the one thing that all of a sudden the heavens open up and the power of God moves through you because you get let loose of your pride. Well, that went on for months. Him going to the altar. About the time the Holy Ghost started getting on him, he'd shut it down. I thought to myself, "Mm mm-hmm. I told him one night in a revival, I got by him, I said, Brother Gary, I said, if you'll just yield in the hands of the potter and you say, not my will, your will, whatever you want, whatever that means. I'm not kidding you when I tell you all of a sudden that that put together, I won't never shout, I won't never run, I won't never jerk. Boy, he, he flipped clean over the backwards of the altar, flipped in the floor, shouted, kicked his feet, looked like a fish that just fell out of water. I mean, he bucked and jerked and kicked and shouted and spoke in tongues and the Holy Ghost baptized him. He wanted him to be a preacher of the gospel. You know what he had to do? He had to quit going to the door and stopping and going, Nope, it's going to rain today. And the, the, the clouds are just, oh, it's a black sky. It don't look like it's going to work. You've got to quit letting circumstance stop you. Well, I, don't, I, I just, there's a, there's a few things right now, Pastor, that, that, that people that talk about me, and, and I don't want them seeing me. And uh, the church, you know, I think they might be videoing these services, and I sure don't want anybody to see me doing all that online and everything let me tell you something if i can shout right here i could care less if the president or anybody else sees me because if i ain't good enough to shout in front of the world i mean what is water baptism good for it's a public profession of faith that says i don't care what you think i'm gonna serve the master come on somebody but I'm telling you, when you get to that place in your life, you've got to ask yourself a question. Is the reason that I don't turn loose, is it because of past hurt, things that I've been through? And I just don't want to get in too deep, and I don't want to be hurt again. I tired the last church I went to, I got hurt. Church before that, I got hurt. And uh, listen, there's a lot of folks that just use that as an excuse to, to hop around, and please don't do that. But I will tell you this, there's also some people that are suffering from some self-guilt And I was on the way here tonight, and God specifically told me to say this, and I'm going to tell you, I don't know if you're here, you're online, but somebody, I'm about to tell you what the Lord told me to tell you. And you'll know it because the shoe's going to fit. You have blamed yourself, and you come to church, you think about getting in, you think about getting something from God, but you have self-guilted yourself to the place that you don't even feel worthy enough to turn loose. You won't let yourself get the full blessing because you have guilted yourself. Well, look what I've gone through. Look what I've done. Look how many people I've hurt. Look what this and look what that. And the devil's lying to you. Either God's forgave you or he ain't. Stop going to the doorway and going back in the house the same way you went to the door. You're letting the thing you cannot stop, stop you. My God in heaven, somebody better hear what I'm telling you. You've let the devil stop you from ministering long enough. I've ruined my testimony, Pastor. I'm I'm preaching to somebody I know. I've ruined my testimony. I've said things. It doesn't look like the right time. I, I just don't know. I just don't know. I would to God. That we as a people can turn loose and let go of all this staunch formality to stop standing in the threshold or on the threshold of change and being so close to having everything I need. For some people, you're turning loose isn't because you got a handful of seed you need to scatter. For some people, there's some things in your life that you have yet to let go of, some hard feelings, some bitterness, 
some anger, some frustration. And you just keep holding on to it. And Pastor Myers came along here to preach in this revival to tell you. Let me show you what you're doing. This is what you do. I want more of the Lord. You go back defeated. Later on, you get to thinking about it. You maybe try it again. Well, I need more of the Lord. And you just you come up against that wall and you just can't seem to get past it. And there's some of you that know what I mean because there was a time in your life where you could get down and pray. Boy, it was just like, like a waterfall. That would just come to you. But now it's almost like every time you turn around, just coming up against the wall. Wouldn't it do you some good to just go ahead and turn loose and quit worrying about what anybody thought? How, when's the last time you went to a prayer meeting? You ever been in a prayer meeting and ain't nobody getting loud and you're like this, Lord, Jesus, Lord God. And then you got folks like me and Sister Wendy who don't care if anybody hears you. And you just start talking and everybody's already like, my Lord in heaven, who are they yelling at? Huh? I'm going to tell you, when I first got saved, I was glad there was people like that because then I didn't have to worry about somebody hearing what I was saying. But it would do you some good to get in another prayer meeting and be, or come down to the altar when the altar calls. Like, you know what? My life is nothing to brag about. And there's a whole lot of things I'm ashamed of. But I'm just going to be real tonight. I'm going to be raw. It ain't pretty. It's ugly. But I know somebody who can take the, white, the, the red blood of Jesus Christ and though your sins be as scarlet, he shall make them white as snow. I'm going to put some stuff on this altar and I'm coming up a brand new man. There are some of you, it's been a long time since the gift of the Spirit have been in operation. Ain't it a sad day that it used to be that almost every time you came to a Pentecostal church, you'd hear the gifts of the Spirit in operation. And I'm not just talking about one or two, but all the gifts of the Spirit in operation. Today, it's so few and far between. Some of us could pass for an all-denominational or a Baptist church. And I'm not throwing off on nobody. Please, don't misunderstand me. But if you represent something, either be it or you ain't it. And I'm going to tell you tonight, I represent the full gospel of the New Testament. And that New Testament book shows me tonight that the whole gift, all the gifts, all of the Spirit is what the church needs to operate in tonight. I want to share with you something as we get ready to close here tonight. I, I, I just want you to see you have to come to a place where you start asking yourself, what excuses have I allowed to stop me? What, what excuses have I? I mean, because when we had a lot less, there were times we did a whole lot more. You know, today we're too busy and and then sometimes we'll find ourselves doing stuff, and then the Lord will remind you, say, well, you've been telling everybody you're too busy, but you've got plenty of time. Look at what you're doing now. I can remember times in a, in a little house church in the middle of nowhere, me and another brother, his family, my family, sometimes a couple visitors. Well, he had so many kids. With my kids and his kids, we had a football team anyway. And I am not telling you any story. What I'm about to tell you, we had some of the most powerful services in a little bitty house church with metal folding chairs. I have preached in places where there'd be 150, 200 people and plus, and, and it dries cracker juice. You know the reason why? Because we get so stuck in formality, we ain't willing to turn loose. When you start coming to the house of God and you're willing to just obey God, let me tell you, if you're a singer in this church, let me give you some great advice. Don't get up there and let the devil beat you into a bashful state of mind. You, get, you know one of the things that drew many of you to Sister Wendy? How can I be candid here? Is the fact that she's raw, she's sincere, she's real, and she is in the devil's face. She ain't backward and timid and shy when it comes to the things of God. Do you know that when you get out of that shell and you turn loose, 
You're going to be an inspiration to the rest of your family. We need more choir directors and more song leaders and guitar players and piano players. And we need more youth leaders and associate pastors who will just let go and shout, run, shake, jerk under the power of God, move under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. When the Lord tells you to get up and pray for somebody, get up and pray. Let me tell you what's happened to a lot of folks. I'll tell you what's happened to a lot of folks. I can tell you because I'm a pastor. It always breaks my heart. You get people go to the altar. They get under conviction. They go to the altar to get something. And you get a house full of people that if you did a poll and how many is baptized in the Holy Ghost? Whoa, I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost. And we'll leave them down at the altar praying by themselves. Well, you know, I got to get down to McDonald's before they get done with that 99-cent Big Mac special they had. I heard the McRib is in town. I got to get down there. Get me a shamrock shake. Huh? The problem is, is that we have chosen formality over the dynamic. And when we get tired, you see, this is what, what the Holy Ghost sent me here to do. I, I've shared this in the past, and I'm just going to share it again tonight. But my grandmother mean, meant a whole lot to me, and there's one thing my grandmother could do. One of the healthiest stuff in the world, but my grandmother could cook. It might be slap full of grease and fat back, and it might have fat hanging all off the side of it. And uh, but she could cook. And there were times that I went to Grandma's house, and on the way there we stopped and got a sub sub or something like that, you know, on the way there, and we already ate. But when I come down that dirt road, my, my grandparents, they grew up in hard times. I mean, it could be 85, 89 degrees outside and the sun beaming straight down. They have all the windows open and a fan going in there and it feel like 100 degrees in the house. And I thought, how in the world they do it? You get in the shower, you turn on the water, you soap up and turn the water off. I thought, Lord, have mercy. But, you know, they grew up in a generation that understood things we don't understand. And, and my grandma would have them windows open, Sister Wendy, and I'd come down that dirt bumpy road, and you could smell fried chicken and collard greens, and you could smell whole cake from down the street. And uh, my grandma would cook some whole cake and put some onions in. If y'all don't like onions, well, bless the Lord anyway. She'd put some onions in that whole cake, and I mean, it just about make your tongue do somersaults. And I come down that road, and we had already ate. But whenever we got to that house, and we started pulling up in the driveway, my backbone, my stomach's already kissing each other. And I'm thinking to myself, it's about time to eat, ain't it? And the reality was I hadn't out long ate. But you know the reason why the Holy Ghost sent me here for tonight in this revival? is through the Holy Ghost's help is to be able to create such an atmosphere that we are reminded of the things that God's done in the past. We remind ourselves of how many moves of God we've been in. Because church, you better understand this. We, if we're not careful, we'll sit around dead so long that we get so used to being dead that we forget what it means to be a people of a, of a living God. A God that's alive and a God that's powerful and a God in the move of the Holy Holy Ghost. Hey man, I want to tell you something. I'm not ashamed of my Pentecostal roots. I'm not ashamed of what God's done in my life. I'm not ashamed of the power of God. I'm not ashamed of the nights that I've watched demons cast out because somebody turned loose. I'm not ashamed of the nights uh, that we watched the power of God fall and sinners come to the altar crying. I'm not ashamed of the nights that I watched sinners get under conviction. Not a preacher didn't preach a word, but the power of God fell right in the music, uh, right the worship and you'd watch sinners come to the altar and they're putting their cigarettes and their Copenhagen and they're putting their junk on the altar. Amen. Nobody even said anything. Why? Because somebody knew what it meant to turn loose. I told my wife before we left the house tonight, I said, I've got to remind myself. I preach myself to death. I love these people so much. I'll preach and preach and preach and i got to share this and I'm going to have to try to close. Refuge Church, you need to understand something very, very, very vital. Every time a new soul walks through the doors of this church, what they see, what they hear, what they feel, what they experience, they are prone to imitate. They are prone to become like 
You take a baby and raise him in a quiet family, oftentimes he's quiet. And I'm not just talking about loud and quiet. I'm just talking about bringing up a child in a church where people ain't ashamed of what they believe. Huh? They don't care if they wake up the roaches next door. They're going to let the devil and everybody in town know that they are alive and well and Jesus is in their heart. Because if we're not mindful, we come to church, well, you know, I had a bad day. I had a long day. I don't want to open my mouth up too big. I don't know if that sister in front of me, her sister, I think she had COVID-19, and I don't want to open my mouth too big. I don't want to shout too loud. It might come my way, and I might suck it in. And so I'm just going to I'm just gonna hold it in. I'm not going to turn loose of it. I'm just going to hold it all in tonight. And you're going to come like this, and you're going to leave. How many times have you done that? How many times have you come to church? And there was somebody in that service you could have been a blessing to. You could have stood up and testified and really changed the dynamics of somebody's tomorrow. But you know what? I don't feel like testifying tonight. I think I'm going I'm a, I'm to a, I'm a hold on to my, I'm going to hold on to that testimony and I'm not going to say nothing. Sister Wendy came around and asked me, said, Honey, will you sing a special? Well, my. I don't want to pick up one of them microphones. You never know who's been singing in it. I just. Now, y'all laughing, but you're laughing, but I'm going to tell you something. There's stuff people don't say, and they think. So you just come to church, you can hold on to it. And then the altar calls given. So, well, I've been in this thing all my life. Bless the Lord. I've been saved longer than that preacher been alive. And so I think I'm just going to. Hold on to it. There should never be a time that I could ever imagine that somebody in need goes to our altars and they're down there praying all by themselves. There's some of you here tonight that whenever you got baptized with the Holy Ghost, there was there was sisters and brothers gathered around you and they was praying. Lord, baptize her in the Holy Ghost. Isn't it selfish for us to say, well, you know, I got mine. And I've been, I've been filled since, you know, I'm 1982. And will you turn loose? Will you turn loose? Will you let go? Will you let God have his way? Am I right? Some of you older church saints tonight. That some of the older saints for many years, it wasn't an uncommon thing to hear them say, let go and let God. Don't let what you cannot stop tonight. Don't let it stop you. Will you stand all across the house? Someone come to the music tonight, please. As we close this service, I want to tell you, I have borne my heart with sincerity tonight. Come on, somebody. Will you raise your hands tonight? Just begin to worship the Lord. I mean, if it tonight says, I've held back long enough, I'm ready to just let the Lord have His way. There's some of you been holding that. You've been holding back too long. Will you lift your hands tonight? Say, God, touch me in my mind and my spirit. If you're here tonight, you say, I need to be baptized and refilled with the Holy Ghost. I want you to know the altar's open right now. Would you come right now? Somebody that says, I want more. I need more tonight. Maybe you're that person that God spoke to and said, you've let guilt, you've let your own self-guilt trap you and prevent you from believing that you even deserve. Well, let me tell you, none of us deserve anything outside the blood. But for the grace of God tonight, God has sent me by here to remind somebody. You've been holding on too long, but it's time to let go. Oh, would you come and pray? Come on and pray. Now's your opportunity to turn loose for the first time in a long time. You say, I'm going down to that altar. Maybe you can find yourself a place right at, right at your pew. Come on, you can use good judgment and wisdom. 
Come on, you can get right down where you're, where you're sitting at tonight and find yourself a place and begin to pray. Maybe for too long, you've allowed the devil to cheat you out of what God wanted to do in you. Some of you have got family and friends that you've looked up to for years. You admired their walk with God because of how they obeyed the Lord. How many of you tonight will obey the Lord? Will you come on tonight? Get down and pray. Talk to the Lord. Just you and the Lord tonight. Go ahead, Sister Whitney. more excuses. of you that you've been used in the pulpit of this church before when's the last time you were used of God when you took that mic and just obeyed God you didn't worry what the devil thought or anybody else time to turn loose
Holy Ghost, let him do it. 